I'm deeply honored by um, be the uh, 2015 laureate of the, uh, the Gerner Global Award. Uh, and uh, it, it is true that uh, I can see, as Peter said, that the other awards were kind of uh, building up to, to this one. But for me, and, and I've not said that in the other, uh, for the other awards, it's because of uh, it's a, an award coming, it's a Canada Gardner Award. <clears throat> and um, because I have a long-standing relationship with, with Canada, uh, or with Canadians, I should say, that's probably more correct, uh, which started on the 1st of May, 1979, so last century, when I landed in uh, uh, Winnipeg to see uh, Alan Ronald, it was snowing, and uh, I, uh, you know, we, there was an epidemic of what was supposed to be a tropical uh, sexually transmitted infection, the chancroid in First Nation people. And uh, I think we were maybe five people in the whole world who had any experience, clinical and uh, microbiological experience of chancroid. And um, that was the beginning of a, uh, a great collaboration, a scientific journey, and uh, long-standing friendships. And uh, so I worked and directly particularly with uh, Frank Plummer, who is here. And uh, uh, little did I know when we were having our uh, you know, parties and uh, work in, in uh, Nairobi that Frank would be um, instrumental also in, um, you know, in the public health agency, the, la the labs in, uh, in, in Winnipeg, leading indeed to um, what is probably the, you know, one of the biggest achievements, certainly on the scientific side, of the uh, fight against Ebola, uh, of the recent uh, epidemic. Um, and on the other side of the country, in Quebec, we, uh, you know, um, the long-standing, um, you know, collaboration with Michel Alary from, uh, from Laval. And so and I could go on for quite a while. I was uh, supposed to be the chair of the board and the boss of Alan Bernstein, which was uh, when we were working on the um, Chavi vaccine enterprise. And uh, again, that was also uh, a very important learning experience. So I owe a lot to Canada, and uh, thank you for that, uh, in addition to thank you for the, for the uh, award. Uh, tomorrow I'll um, go in the, in the Gerner Lecture Award, uh, award lecture, uh, more into the trajectory and, and then today and today I'd rather um, give a kind of an introduction to the to the symposium and I'm very grateful to um, my colleagues and friends who've been traveling quite uh, from afar and to um, you know to highlight uh, some specific aspects of not only Ebola but um, you know other uh, epidemics and um, let me see how to start here yeah now, where to start? Uh, last year I became 65. And um, you now for to, to celebrate the 65th anniversary, Heidi and I went to DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo. I think we were probably the only tourists in the whole country. And uh, to have a look how, uh, you know, the, uh, what the Financial Times, because uh, this is the paper with the highest impact factor that I've ever published in the FT Weekend magazine, but it doesn't count in our research evaluation framework in the UK, but uh, one day it'll come. Um, and uh, of course, the, the FT put this um, title on there, on the cover, um, Ebola Ground Zero. Little did we know, this was, we went, this was in February um, 2014. This came out in May 2014. And little did we know that at that time, um, you know, what was brewing, cooking, and exploding in, uh, in West Africa. Um, and um, what we found was, of course, the, the same um, mission hospital that uh, uh, where the first outbreak in 76, the first known outbreak had happened. Um, and you see on the right, uh, the convent. We, we went with the Professor Jean-Jacques Mouyembe, who for a professor from uh, Kinshasa, who was the first uh, scientist actually to see a case of Ebola and took samples and all that. Um, and um, this is also uh, given illustration of uh, how well or protected or not protected that we were while we were seeing patients. It was just a, uh, a latex gloves and a paper mask and some motorbike goggles. 
basically, and um, that was it. But what was really sobering is that the state of that hospital, of the whole region, was they were much worse off than um, nearly 40 years ago. Um, of course, there have been civil wars, and you could see the bullets in the, you know, uh, in, on the walls and all that. But there were no jobs, uh, no cars, and, um, and the hospital was in a, in a much worse state. And that after, in January 77, there was a meeting convened by WHO and said, never again, um, we will do everything we can. We will do health system strengthening, uh, epidemiologic surveillance, uh, laboratory strengthening. I mean, we can all make that list, a long list. And, um, and what happened? Nothing. They left and abandoned this whole region. Um, for some understandable reasons, because uh, afterwards there was civil war and so on, but still, um, for me, this was the most shocking experience. And um, this man is called Sukato. He's a survivor of Ebola from 1976. Still there. He's running the lab. He's got a micro decent microscope. This is the only equipment in the lab, elder equipment. And these are the only reagents. And that's to serve a, a hospital of 120 uh, people. It illustrates how um, Ebola can, um, on the one hand, thrives on uh, poverty, on um, dysfunctional systems of all kinds, but also how um, we have to um, be very mindful that when promises are made, we should hold those who make the promises accountable and uh, we should not uh, have history repeat itself in this way. So, um, and I must say that um, over the years, uh, I only worked on the Ebola uh, actively for about a, a couple of years, but I really thought and that this will not be a um, public health issue. Um, and one of the reasons is that when you look at the theory of um, you know, the population dynamics of infectious diseases with the the Anderson-May formula of reproductive uh, rate uh, being the result of uh, the product of the probability of transmission, number of contacts, and duration of infections. Uh, and by all standards, um, in that case, Ebola should now not become a big issue. Because um, probability of transmission, it requires very close contact, contact with bodily fluids, or as we illustrated, we document in the first uh, epidemic, uh, contaminated needles and injections, which is, of course, the best way to transmit uh, viruses. Um, but so it's, it's really, it's not like, uh, you know, um, measles or the flu or the flu. Um, number of contacts is also very limited because it's only the people who have direct uh, contact uh, with bodily fluid. And duration of infectiousness, I mean, it may sound cynical, but since um, a majority of, uh, of patients die within a week or 10 days, um, again, it's not like HIV where you can infect people over 10, 15 years um, with, uh, of, of uh, an infection that, and, and where you still be relatively healthy. So when you look at that, um, it is unlikely that you'd have an epidemic. And yet, we had uh, not an epidemic, we had a real major uh, humanitarian crisis. And, uh, and so a few weeks, uh, a few months uh, later, we knew that in uh, West Africa, in the three countries, uh, that um, um, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and, uh, and Liberia, that there was an outbreak that started in, um, in a corner of, uh, uh, of Guinea, um, in Gekedu, and, and where the, um, you know, in the border area with three, con with three, con three countries, and uh, which spread then like wildfire. And what was very new um, is that um, for the first time, capitals were involved, major cities, entire countries, and a very protracted type of uh, epidemic. And um, it is um, really, the question was in the beginning, I, um, I didn't pay that much attention to it because I thought, okay, it's uh, uh, when we were in, in May, when, uh, in, April, in, in March, when the diagnosis was made after three months, and I must say that, um, you know, um, you only find what you're looking for. And nobody was looking for Ebola in West Africa. So I can understand that, uh, you know, diagnosis took three months. And uh, also that, you know, because the infrastructure was just not there. 
But when that was announced, and I read it in uh, ProMed, I thought, okay, this will be like uh, all the previous 25 known outbreaks. And MSF uh, was there, and I, you know, I, I really have enormous confidence in MSF. They uh, were the most experienced institution, organization in the world, dealing with Ebola since 1995, the, uh, the Kikwit outbreak. And, um, um, but then when in June uh, MSF said the epidemic is out of control, I looked at everything uh, very carefully. Uh, and I thought, is this a bit of a hyperbolic way of, uh, you know, um, of fundraising, or is it, uh, uh, is it real? And I thought it was real, because there were cases in Conakry, more than one country involved, and it was more like a gut feeling than kind of e strong evidence that told me this is different. This is different, and um, the question then is, why is it different? What happened? And I think that's something that we could uh, and we should discuss also, because um, this uh, is an important lesson for preventing major outbreaks. We will not be able to prevent um, you know, outbreaks to the start of it, because uh, this is a zoonosis, and it will happen. But what we can do is prevent big epidemics. And the first, there were rumors, and they say, oh, this is a different virus. It's a different virus, much more virulent, and all that. And, and, uh, and today we know this is from, there are several uh, papers now on the, the, the genomics uh, of the, the virus. This is from Miles Carroll from Public Health England and many collaborators that came out in Nature uh, two weeks ago or, so, or three weeks ago. And uh, basically, it's, this, it's the Zaire strain, but of course, as time goes by, uh, that the virus, uh, you know, mutates and that becomes uh, more diverse, which has been extremely useful for, um, you know, at the end of the epidemic, particularly when we have, um, you know, on, you know, on-site um, sequencing going on to identify when we have cases, are they part of an own chain or are they, uh, you know, a new uh, kind of outbreak and, and so on. So it was not a new virus. And so uh, about a year ago, I, I published an editorial in Science and I call this a, a perfect storm. It was not the virus that was different. It was the environment, the fertile ground that it found and where you've got lots of elements that exist about everywhere but that all came together at the same time from uh, countries that came out of uh, you know, civil war, corrupt dictatorship, with uh, professionals having left the country, health systems um, not functional, and we're being, ironically, uh, all the, the three countries were really doing quite well in terms of rebuilding societies. Um, very importantly, I think, um, total lack of trust in government and when the government says, okay, we've got an epidemic and you've got to do this, the first thing people say, oh, what's the agenda? There's something behind that. Um, and then, of course, traditional beliefs um, about disease causation and, um, you know, and, and then funeral rites, which I think are very moving. Um, we should not really look down on them, uh, but just we have to make sure that they are, um, are safe. Um, and that associated with a slow response in the first place nationally, but then also uh, internationally, and I come back to that. Now, what's interesting also is that these three countries had three fairly different epidemics, different patterns, I won't go into detail, but very uh, different uh, dynamics, and that's also true within one country. So this is a quite detailed analysis from John Edmonds's group, and uh, by district in, uh, in Sierra Leone, again, not going into detail, but each district was a bit different, which also means that um, we, we talk about the global response and all that, but everything has to be thought through locally. What are the local dynamics and how to deal with that? Um, and, uh, and never before did we have this kind of uh, experience. Now, a lot has been said and, and will be said, I hope, about the uh, certainly initial failure of the um, global response. The, the, the national response was also there, but I think there is um, the fact that uh, there was absolutely zero experience with dealing with this, I think is, uh, I would say, it makes it more understanding. Uh, it's less um, uh, acceptable that um, those international institutions that are supposed to deal with this uh, also fail to respond in the first place, the World Health Organization. And, um, and even, um, you know, the heroic efforts of an MSF um, can never, an NGO cannot replace a state. 
um, can deal with one outbreak and or maybe three or five, but that's it, you know. Uh, this requires um, governmental intervention and international solidarity. And the, just the fact that it took um, until uh, August before WHO declared this outbreak a public health emergency of international concern, which is a code word under the international health regulations, there are no excuses uh, for that. Um, when in June I, uh, I felt, because it's really the gut feeling, as I mentioned, that this was different, I went to, um, you know, to CNN, to Christiana Nampur, and gave a long interview and said, what we need is a state of emergency, and we need a quasi-military operation. And I, when I left the studio, I, you know, I'm Flemish. I'm supposed not to be into a hyper type of uh, talks and so on. I said, oh my God, what did I say here? Um, but on the other hand, I didn't see how uh, by business as usual and a little bit of uh, public health measures, one can control an epidemic that was on the way out of, uh, you know, out of control. Uh, but also I should say that once the international support was there, and the community response as well, that um, you know, the number of cases started uh, continued to increase. But by um, December, January, there was a, a beginning of, uh, of a decline. And uh, I think it is a, it's a, an illustration that when you do something, you have results. At the same time, there was in, um, you know, in DRC, in, in, in Congo, in a place called Boende in central uh, Congo, also an outbreak of Ebola. And no, DRC is not famous for having uh, wonderful health systems and, uh, and being a very well organized country. And yet, they succeeded mostly with their own means, with a bit of uh, uh, you know, help of uh, MSF, the local MSF, to control this epidemic um, and uh, to prevent it from uh, getting out of hand. Partly because it was a very isolated region hard to get there, so it's not the mobility that we see in West Africa, but also because of leadership, resolute action. Um, the Minister of Health himself immediately went there, sent the team, and they organized it all. They have experience, but they also uh, take action and took action uh, promptly. So it is not just a matter of defunct health systems, but it's also, in the first place, leadership and acting properly, but also being able to have the diagnosis. Just as uh, Mr. said, you know, um, before the Winnipeg lab was uh, established, uh, Canada did not have the means to, um, you know, to diagnose this kind of infection. Now, in Kinshasa, they can do some you know, PCR and certain tests, um, and they no longer have to send this to um, Dakar or to Europe or to uh, CDC and so on. So that's, uh, that's one thing. Now, um, <clears throat> before coming to some of the lessons, we have also had several surprises. The first surprise was, of course, West Africa, not only Central Africa. Second surprise, it can in, uh, affect the whole country. Third surprise, I would say, is that um, there can be also some protracted type of uh, uh, epidemic. And um, sexual transmission, as King Holmes in his, uh, for me, moving message, since he's really been my uh, my big mentor in, um, in my career, um, <clears throat> that sexual transmission is now clearly documented. Uh, there were papers uh, two weeks ago, I think, in the New England Journal of Medicine with very detailed and very elegant uh, documentation of sexual transmission. Uh, but also, already in 1976, Ebola was isolated. There was no PCR, didn't exist. Uh, let's not forget that. Um, <clears throat> Ebola was isolated from seminal fluid of a lab technician in Portendown, a, um, a high security lab in, um, near London, um, and who had accidentally been infected. And for six months, the man had, you know, was excreting um, virus from his semen, uh, but that was the end of the story, and we had no other um, documentation for that. I had the honor in 76, being the youngest member of the, um, uh, of the team, to have to collect uh, semen from um, survivors in Yambuku, which is another story. But, uh, um, but now we, we, the question is, um, what percentage of the 7,000 uh, plus uh, adult men who are survivors of Ebola in West Africa are excreting um, Ebola virus, the semen 
uh, for how long, what are the implications of that? Is this an, uh, a risk for that it becomes um, quasi-endemic or not? We don't know. Um, and um, another uh, surprise or a new thing is that, um, well, we, we, we see quite um, different case fatality rates by a treatment center, not enormously. Um, but what we've seen over the years is that the different strains of uh, Ebola have different rates of uh, case fatality rates. And uh, we don't really understand, again, what are the determinants of, um, you know, of, um, of, the, of fatal infection or not um, among virus types, among people, what is the impact of supportive care? A lot of effort has gone into um, experimental drugs, but not enough, I think, in terms of uh, um, <clears throat> supportive care. And uh, Rob Fowler here from Toronto um, had been a champion of saying we need also as much research on that than on uh, fancy new drugs. Um, and then the long-term consequences, the sequelae. Um, you know, this is a uh, quite spectacular picture uh, of the eyes of Dr. Ian Grozier, who survived Ebola, and this is his normal eye, and the uh, virus has been isolated from the vitreous fluid, and uh, um, his eye turned uh, green because of uh, inflammation. And we had a nurse, uh, Pauline, in, uh, um, in, in, uh, in London, who was in the free, Royal Free, who's still hospitalized with uh, meningoencephalitis. Uh, six, seven months after having been declared cured and t totally Ebola free. We, this, so the studies of survivors uh, are going to be very important for many, many reasons. Um, and we'll hear more about that. Did the interventions make any difference? Um, hard to tell. There was no controlled experiment. Um, but uh, this is a, a complicated table, sorry, of a paper that came out in PNAS. Uh, uh, last uh, week or two weeks ago by a team from our school, and they looked at um, the number of lives saved by the Ebola treatment units. And, um, and secondly, they also, so they, and they put that at about, uh, what is it, 56,000 uh, for Sierra Leone only, and they said also if f these units would have been functional one month earlier, four weeks earlier, that an additional about uh, 13,000 people would have been saved. So timing is everything. Time is everything. And, um, but it's not only the Ebola treatment units. It's also community actions, dignified and safe funerals, an aspect that we uh, all neglected, I think, in the beginning. Um, and finally, um, well, two final things. One is that um, I, I really appreciate what uh, Peter asked us to remember and remind uh, and have some minute of silence for all those who died. And that includes over 500 healthcare workers. Now, Ebola would not be such a um, disaster and not such have an impact if um, it would not completely uh, paralyze the healthcare system and the rest of society, education, commerce, and so on. And um, the, uh, it may be, and there are indications of that, that more people died from non-Ebola causes because they could not be treated uh, properly in the healthcare system because it was not functional, because doctors, nurses, and so on um, were dying and could not uh, do their normal work. That's one of the main reasons also that a vaccine would make such a big difference uh, in this epidemic, not only because it would protect people uh, in general, the population from uh, acquiring Ebola infection, but also it would protect society as a whole because the first line of defense of society of health, um, you know, the healthcare system uh, could then, in theory, function relatively normally if they would be protected by a vaccine. So congratulations to all those here who worked on the, um, you know, the VSV vaccine from the Winnipeg team to uh, Merck and all the people involved in it, and I'm very proud that our school was uh, involved in the trial in, uh, in Ebola, and here is the paper that came out in The Lancet and showing clearly that the uh, vaccine protects, whether it's 100% or not. I mean, that's, these are things that we still have to work out, and we still have to continue the vaccine research until um, not only that they're 
you know, we go through regulatory processes, which are sometimes a bit of a challenge, particularly in this kind of environment. Um, but also, um, we need to see whether we need different vaccines for uh, short-term protection, for long-term, and so on and so on. But well done, and it, let's not forget, this is the first time ever, not only in an Ebola outbreak, but in a big outbreak, be it SARS or MERS, or even influenza, that, uh, as the surgeons would say, I show, uh, you know, um, this kind of research was done. Remarkable. Um, and uh, since we're involved with vaccine research also in, uh, in, with another vaccine from uh, Janssen, um, you know, setting all that up in a, in a country like Sierra Leone is, is really complicated. So that's, a, that's a, a good news, silver lining. Finally, um, we still don't know enough about where this virus is hiding, about the reservoir. This is, uh, um, let's not forget that Ebola has never been isolated from the wild, from a bat and so on. Pieces of RNA, yes, and, uh, and, uh, and the certain bats are the only animals that when experimentally infected, challenged, are not dying immediately. But unlike for Marburg, which has been isolated, Ebola has not. It's likely, but it's not totally proven yet. And uh, better understanding of the ecology is really important. This is from paper from, the, from Simon Hayes group at uh, Oxford, and trying to find out what the, you know, the distribution is of certain types of bats and so on. And you can see Central Africa, but then also parts of West Africa. But these are preliminary work. And so let's not forget that um, all emerging infections that we know are zoonoses. So just studying human primates is not enough. We need to look at animals also. And this brings me to um, the other zoonoses, the big zoonoses of our time, and that is uh, HIV. People will probably not think about it in this, these terms. Um, we have bats, this is, um, but um, HIV as um, you know, in, in my lab, Martin Peters was the first one to isolate a um, SIV from a chimpanzee. 98% uh, uh, sequence correlated with, uh, with human HIV. And um, that's uh, an, an epidemic that also originated in, uh, in, in, in an animal. And, uh, and there will be more like that, we, we can be sure. Um, HIV, um, I'll show only two slides on it and that uh, on the one hand, major achievements uh, in terms of what counts at the end of the day, uh, fewer people dying, and that started in 2005, um, and that was uh, basically directly as the result of introduction of uh, antiretroviral therapy on a large scale, about 10 years after it was announced at the conference here in Canada, in Vancouver, that antiretroviral therapy uh, can treat um, and a uh, number of infections already started going down in 98, 99. But there are still 2 million new infections per year and 1.2 million people who die. And uh, so it's a bit premature uh, to say that this is the end of AIDS, or uh, I would say there's a lot of uh, rhetoric that the end is in sight and all they have to do is treat people. Um, I think that that, of course, will help, and it's clear that uh, Treatment of prevention is, uh, you know, well documented in couples, population level not, but uh, that is being, uh, you know, being tested um, in large studies, uh, both in Africa and also here in North America and Europe. Um, but um, we shouldn't neglect that, uh, you know, the basics uh, of prevention, combination prevention, and also um, without a vaccine, I don't believe that the end of HIV is actually possible. Um, that was something that came out of a report that we published in The Lancet in June. Um, and um, so here now to the lessons and then I'll stop. Um, first of all, I think in terms of lessons from AIDS, they are very important because they have set a new tone in terms of uh, global health. Um, and uh, it was interesting that in terms of the response to AIDS, very much driven by science with fairly rapid um, application of uh, scientific discoveries, be it um, treatment as prevention, pre-exposure prophylaxis, but also, um, of course, antiretroviral therapy. Very rapid implementation, um, but also driven by human rights. Because without that human rights drive, we would still not have access to treatment. 
because the common wisdom, particularly from public health experts and development experts, was this is not possible. Therefore, and then uh, they spend meetings and meetings and meetings discussing why it's not possible to treat people with antiretroviral therapy in developing countries, rather than to spend that energy on saying, how are we going to get there? Uh, and that's what we did. Um, also, I would say the interaction between global commitments, the global fund, and so on, you need, and the local action could be very, very uh, complementary. Um, we, there were specific funding mechanisms, PEPFAR in the US, global fund. Um, initially an emergency response, and now, and that's uh, there the AIDS movement is not so good at, the long term. We need the long term, lifelong treatment, lifelong prevention. The importance of the going outside the, bio, the, the health sector, legal uh, things and so on, to think of injecting drug use, harm reduction, and then politics were making all the difference positively or negatively. And the two only uh, health issues that have ever been discussed at the uh, UN Security Council are AIDS, that was the first meeting of the new millennium on the 10th of January uh, 2000, here it's shared by Vice, then Vice President uh, Al Gore and uh, my boss Kofi Annan at the time, and then last year uh, Ebola. And so they really, I think I would call them the two defining epidemics of our time, and I feel very privileged to have been associated with it. And, uh, and there have been bigger epidemics of, uh, in t than Ebola, that's for sure, and particularly flu. Uh, SARS has been there, but they did not have that impact. And uh, the question is now, will uh, Ebola be uh, the same of a similar game changer for global health as uh, AIDS has been? Because AIDS really did a few things. Uh, introduced, it, divided, it, it disrupted the, the divide between prevention and treatment, new forms of activism and advocacy, new global funding, reduced the cost of essential medicines, human rights as a driver, and was really a major boost for global health research of all kinds. Will Ebola now the same? And I think we should not miss that opportunity and take it to the next level. That is our challenge. We all know there will be, uh, there have been many, many um, emerging infections, there will be more are we prepared for the next epidemic? I doubt it. I doubt it. Um, and uh, again, we should not rest until we've taken on the lessons learned from Ebola. Um, at preventing disease uh, outbreaks, um, uh, you know, responding to major outbreaks, um, the national governments, global governance, R&D and knowledge sharing, all this will be discussed today. Uh, there are a number of um, you know, of panels that are, um, you know, making recommendations. Uh, I'm sharing one with the Harvard um, Global Health Initiative and the London School, and that will come out at the end of the month. Um, so we should make sure that that doesn't remain on the shelf and that action is made. And we should never forget that whatever we recommend, we should also bear in mind where's the capacity. This is just for HIV. Uh, the new recommendations of WHO are that everybody should be treated immediately, uh, regardless of CD4 counts and all that. So this is the mass of, uh, you know, one of those maps of uh, this HIV prevalence in the world. This is the, uh, the physicians working in Africa as an indicator of the capacity. There's a complete mismatch. Um, clearly also on the R&D side, um, we need to do better. We need to have special mechanisms, I think, for developing um, vaccines in the first place where there is market failure, no market incentive. You can't expect from pharmaceutical companies um, that they invest in, you know, in developing products that where there's not going to be a market. Um, the same is even true for public health uh, agencies. And if we have these, uh, uh, these experimental vaccines, it was not for public health reasons, but because of bioterrorism concerns. And that's fine. Um, but so there was a call by um, Stanley Plotkin and uh, uh, Jeremy Farrar and uh, Adel Mahmoud for a, a global vaccine development fund. Uh, and so I think this is something that we should discuss, um, not only for Ebola, but more. And this is my last slide. I would say that um, the main lesson for me is that uh, we need a, a triangle where all the stars are aligned. You know, science is there and is important, but if it's not, uh, supported by politics, um, it will have zero impact. If it cannot rely on services to implement, it won't have. 
and politics without the evidence can be very risky. We've seen that with uh, AIDS, when, with the President Mbeki, for example, who didn't believe that HIV exists and so on, and we need to strengthen services. So all this will uh, come together, I'm sure, in the discussions today. And um, again, I'm very grateful for all the uh, panelists and the speakers. Thank you so much for listening. Thank <clears throat> you.